welcome to this very important and, dare I say, need I say, urgent conference, a very important conference at a time, as we well know, of great and growing pressure on democracy and open society, not only here in Hungary, but across Europe, and indeed around the world, certainly in the United States, where I come from. Um, I think the great thing about this conference, and I will just say a very few words of introduction and then turn things back over to the dean, is that it has a strong affirmative message, rolling back the rollback. That's kind of a, uh, you have to think about it a little bit, but I think it's a message that carries with it not only an analysis of the situation involving democracy and various places, but also it involves looking at new approaches and new strategies, things that are happening with respect to democratic participation uh, in various places, things that can be looked at from the point of view of either a laboratory or, in fact, a reality, but certainly that need to be examined closely and will be examined in this conference. Just a few words about Central European University. We are on the front lines of this contest over democracy, and that's where we belong. The university was founded, as most of you know, in 1991. It was founded in the dying embers of the two anti-democratic ideologies of the 20th century, fascism and communism. It was founded by leaders of a long struggle against these destructive ideologies. Václav Havel, Arpad Gunc from Hungary, Bronislav Geremek from Poland, George Soros, of course, the founding heart of the university, and many others. And the mission of CEU at that time was to establish a beachhead for open society, to overcome the legacy of half a century of totalitarianism. So today we are in a new contest between fears about change and hopes for the future, between structures of control and frameworks of freedom. And I think today that contest has intensified, and CEU, of course, is in the middle of it, as all of us are here this morning, and its mission is more urgent than at any time since it was founded. One of the responses of Central European University to this contest that I've been referring to has been to build a school of public policy. And not just any school of public policy, but a school with a unique purpose and a distinct and distinctive characteristics. And these characteristics are bringing together theory and practice, scholarship, and those who are engaged in the field, practitioners on the faculty, together with scholars who are experts in all aspects of democratic <coughs> governance and the contest over democracy. The school also has a civil society focus, which makes it truly unique, I believe, among schools of public policy, most of which focus on government and governance in the countries or in the regions in which they uh, exist, whereas the School of Public Policy focuses on the role of civil society and social movements in politics and in governance. And as we certainly know from all of the developments, many of which will be discussed, I'm sure, at this conference, around the social media and the developments of civil society in that respect, this is in some ways the cutting edge of issues about governance and public policy. The school is also about civic engagement, about students going outside of the classroom. We have a wonderful project that Wolfgang has called the Passion Project, which I, the name of which I think comes from some of our students who decided that's what they wanted to call it, which is projects that they have a passion about, that they wish to work with 
NGOs or governments uh, outside in, in a client context and take risks and promote new ideas and become change agents in that respect. So above all, I would say the mission of the school is about ad, uh, educating students to become open society leaders. And this conference is really what we had in mind when we established the School of Public Policy two years ago. It's both looking ahead and going back to the original mission of CEU. It's both taking the world as we see it with all its challenges for democracy and looking at what might be done to confront and roll back those challenges. So I congratulate you, Wolfgang, and, and all your founding colleagues who are members of the faculty and students and staff of the School of Public Policy for building and organizing, uh, building the school and organizing this conference. And I also want to thank uh, Dean Helmut Unheyer of the Herti School of Governance, who is here this morning. Uh, for his partnership and the partnership of the Herti School here today. So as a longtime participant in the, on the front lines of the struggle that will be discussed here this morning, I look forward to hearing what will be said. Wolfgang, I turn over the proceedings to you. Thank you. Thank you, John, for these uh, warm words of welcome. Um, as usual, um, conferences start a little late, so I'll try to be relatively brief, but do want to elaborate on some of the points that John already made and uh, start with one of the comments, or one of his comments, is that just during the lifetime of this university, that is since 1991, democracy, as we all know, has earned as much praise as it has seen disenchantment in Europe, both East but also West. And again, in recent events, and developments in a number of European countries indeed give rise to serious concerns about the stability of democracy in parts of our continent. Now, we can argue about the definitions. Uh, is it rollback? Is it backsliding? Is it a deficit or what have you? But I think we all cannot ignore a number of changes, such as the cut down on freedom of the press, as well as freedom of association, a contestation of the independence of the judiciary, xenophobia, the EU's own democratic deficit, corruption and erosion of trust in government, and many failed promises, and a crisis of public policy more general, all of which pose growing challenges to the prospects of open societies in Europe. So increasingly, we can read headlines in Europe that ask what has gone wrong with democracy, call it democracy disconnected, call it democracy in distress, and the list could go on. Now, one prominent thinker of the 20th century that many of you know and have read, Albert Hirschman, once wrote about Latin America that, and I quote, the point of departure of any theorist thought about the chances for the consolidation of democracy in Latin America must surely be pessimism. The principal reason is simply that the historical record is so unpromising. And in some ways, again, as John reminded us, these words also hold true for Europe. A cursory look at European history of the 20th century should suffice to make one, if not pessimistic, then at least skeptical. At the same time, it's the very skepticism that leads me to appreciate democracy even more. Echoing one of my own intellectual mentors, the sociologist Juan Linz, who said that democratization has been one of the most exciting and most interesting processes in modern history, a momentum to be sustained and never to be taken for granted. And of course, a momentum attested above all, and here's the dialective, if you will, as far as Europe is concerned, by 70 years of peace in Europe. And so today's challenges to democracy have once again opened a window of opportunity in a world where power is being redefined by technology and economic integration on a global scale. And to this end, the School of Public Policy was built with a vision that changes can be healthy if new constructs replace worn out systems, that dynamism and adaptation is necessary to avoid extinction, that purpose ought to outweigh power, 
And that appreciation for failability and aptitude for reflexivity, which was so well conceptualized by our founder, George Soros, equips us to engage more meaningfully and more practically with converting pessimism into democratic change. And so this forum is envisaged as a space for such a reflection, an open conversation about ways to reconnect democracy, to bring the people back into the equation, and to learn from examples and stories of success to look forward and not so much backward, and hopefully piece together as many ideas as possible on how to roll back the rollback. So before I give a brief overview of the day, let me close with another quote of another mentor of mine that was one of the most foremost experts on democracy, or as he termed it, polyarchy, the late Robert Dahl. And he had the following to say about democracy, and I quote, most of us readily take things for granted that at an earlier time remain to be discovered. And it's in this spirit of rediscovery that I hope all of you have come here today to work with us and develop these new ideas. Let me then talk briefly about the day for just a minute. We'll begin with the broad discussions about the drivers and dimensions of rollback, then move on to the EU and its role as a guardian of democracy in Europe, but I hope also take a close look at its own democratic character. Looking forward, the afternoon floor will be given to younger generations, often called the millennials. We will first assemble a panel dedicated to scrutinizing the democratic potential and limits of the so-called digital spaces and strategies. And later, we will break into four working groups that will analyze key areas of consolidated democracies, legal institutions, political narratives, civil society, of course, and economic regimes. And our panelists and moderators, young and younger, come from all parts of Europe and beyond, but share, as I said last night, at least one thing in common, their dedication to the pursuit of democratic, open, and inclusive societies. And I want to strongly encourage you all to garner ideas from the young and innovative participants. This is their future, and their thoughts and motivation are, after all, the source of the rediscovery that I quoted above and that is so badly needed in Europe and even beyond. We'll reconvene here at the end of the day around five o'clock for a synopsis and outlook, after which we cordially invite you to a special reception over at the School of Public Policy. There's a little map in the program. You see where to go. It's just a short walk. Where we have also invited some of our Hungarian colleagues to comment on yesterday's election here in Hungary, something, of course, that is of very great concern to all of us. Now, as many of you know, this forum is part of a series of events organized in cooperation with the Hertie School of Governance, and we are delighted, as John said already, to have its dean here, Helmut Anheyer, and his colleagues. I'd also like to express our special gratitude to the Robert Bosch Foundation and OSIFE, that is the Open Society Initiative for Europe, for their general support of these series. And now allow me to introduce Kati Marton, the chair of our opening panel. Kati is a distinguished author and journalist, and her career included reporting for ABC News and the National Public Radio. Kati served as the chairwoman of the International Women's Health Coalition. She is a director and former chairwoman of the Committee to Protect Journalists, a board member of the International Rescue Committee, Human Rights Watch, and the New America Foundation. And most importantly, CEU, of course, is honored to have Kati Marton on its board of trustees, and the School of Public Policy has always listened very carefully to her advice, and though she's part of that team that is, has, and is building our school. The theme of today's forum is, I know, close to your heart, Kati. Kati Marton was born here in Hungary, but her family was forced to flee a then authoritarian regime right after 1956 revolution. And Kati published a number of books, including the highly acclaimed autobiography book, Enemies of the People, My Family Journeys to America. So Kati, thank you so much for joining us today. I'd like to wish all of you a very interesting rediscovering, if you will, day and a stimulating intellectual journey. Kati, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Wolfgang.
Thank you so much, Wolfgang. Thank you, John. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Thank you very much for, uh, for coming out on, um, on what is, uh, for many, a uh, rather gloomy day, and I'm not just speaking of the weather. Um, we are, of course, a, um, a nonpartisan, impartial university, um, and we are not a Hungarian university, but, uh, but an international one with an with a, uh, incredibly dynamic uh, international student body, body, many of whom are represented here today, and I am incredibly proud to be part of this great global experiment, which is CEU. Um, our, our topic is rolling back, the rollback, which is a typically optimistic uh, topic for an optimistic institution. Hungary is not famous for its optimism, and with good reason. Uh, as someone who stood in Hero Square in 1989 when communism was uh, officially and finally buried, I have to express my, my own astonishment that the intervening 25 years have brought us well, what we have today, which is a highly questionable democracy, if in fact it is still a democracy. We, uh, I have a very distinguished panel that will attack that problem of, um, of whether Hungary is, can still be deemed a, a full-fledged democracy. Uh, we will, we will um, make this um, a conversation about democracy um, threatened worldwide, but, but since Hungary is such a perfect laboratory case for democracy under threat, and because in my opinion nowhere else has, uh, have democratic institutions been so systematically weakened as, uh, as in Hungary, um, I think it's legitimate for us to, to focus on Hungary. And of course to, um, to focus on, on the election results which uh, which kept many of us awake late at night, whether, 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 um, whether pro or con, the victors. Um, victors seems like the right word. Um, <laughs> an unintended pun. Um, so um, I, I have asked uh, my three extremely distinguished panelists to... Um, to summarize, each in their own field, uh, Renata Lutz, who is the uh, chair of the um, CEU uh, International Law Department, to, to summarize how, how constitutional law has been jeopardized in the last four years. So we will hear from Renata on that subject. Uh, we have uh, the very distinguished Gaspar Tomas, who is as well known in the spires of Oxford as he is in the halls of CEU for his uh, provocative uh, take on, uh, on any number of fields from anthropology to philosophy to a whole bunch of other things um, to, uh, to give us his take on, on uh, what has happened here. And, um, and, and Bela Greskowitz who, who will um, focus on the impact of the rollback of democracy on, um, on economics and on society at large. So it's a tall order, and then we, we want to engage with you as much as possible. Um, so, um, so gentlemen and ladies, uh, let's keep, uh, let's keep our, our comments um, to the point so that we can engage in, in an actual conversation. And um, I, I have to uh, change the rules a little bit because I, I think everybody's attention is, is focused on the election results right now and what they mean. I know mine, I'd, I'd like some, some clarity on, on um, what these numbers represent. So let me, let me just start um, with you, Renata, and, and then we'll go to Gaspar and Bela. Just give me a quick take on, on um, how you see the results, whether, whether there are any surprises here. Um, yes, so let's go over to you, Renata. Thank you very much. I mean, first of all, I, I think that we see that gerrymandering worked perfectly well and how the rules were adjusted by, by players who had constitution-making majority to preserve their, their power. Pull, pull the mic a little closer so everybody can hear you. So to, to see how rules were adjusted by, by a constitution-making majority to sustain themselves in, in power 
uh, seem to have worked pretty, pretty well. If something is surprising, then what is surprising is the record low turnout in the election. So this means that for some reason, and we can talk about the reasons, whether this is fear, apathy, or disconnect, the voters in Hungary did not feel the need to actually go and cast a vote. Maybe this is just the good weather. They went to the weekend gardens. Uh, the important thing, however, is that it's not only that the left failed to mobilize, but also the government party coalition hmm. failed to mobilize because they also got less votes than in the last three elections. Hmm. And the, the third point, which, which is probably interesting to, to make here, is that if you if you look at the potential two thirds majority, it's still unclear because one one mandate is 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 still limping. If there is two thirds majority, this is a two thirds majority one on the votes of of a little over than two million people, which is definitely not two thirds of the entire electorate, which clearly hmm. shows you the skewed translation of votes into mandates, which is in the current. Uh, election rules mm -hmm. and, and constitutional framework. Thank you. Gaspar, what's your take? Uh, <clears throat> well, first of all, uh, it has been the longest period in the history of Hungary of liberal democracy. So we can be proud it lasted a quarter of a century. It has now ended. We can congratulate ourselves. Thank you on that bright note. <laughs> and, uh, right. <laughs> Shall we um, just the fact that only one quarter of the population has voted in a two-thirds majority doesn't really matter. Uh, in politics, is the active people who decide things. And uh, it has been decided. Uh, the Hungarian people is fed up with neoliberal economic and social policies, is fed up with Western arrogance, Western superciliousness, Western duplicity, Western hypocrisy, as it is seen by the public, sometimes fairly, sometimes unfairly. And most certainly, uh, people want to make an end to a system which has been built, among other people, by my generation of dissidents and Democrats of the first hour. We have to be uh, frank with ourselves. That period is now ended and uh, which causes me sadness, but it also causes me uh, anticipation and expectation. Uh, one of the very few MPs elected last night, uh, whom I approve of, among 199, one or two, and uh, she said last night that as Parliament becomes, it has become already a farce, things will be decided on the street. And this is probably the most likely scenario. And uh, if you regard election results in France, if you look at what's happening on the streets of Brussels, you can see that more slowly or more quickly, uh, the post-89 period has ended and new things begin with dangers and hopes that will be definitely different from what it went on before. We have still to understand that this is a watershed for Hungary and the whole period uh, uh, bodes well or ill, but it's a new one, and which cannot be addressed with the old rhetoric of uh, uh, the period that went on before, and a rhetoric that uh, gives its name uh, to what goes on in this university the rhetoric of the open society and of parliamentary democracy and of human rights and of separation of powers, noble ideals, but ideals of the past. Thank you, Gaspar, uh, not for your optimism, but for giving us um, plenty to chew on. And Bela, let's uh, 
hear your take on the election, specifically um, on the election results. Thank you very much. Uh, so, um, since Wolfgang here already mentioned uh, the name of Albert Hirschman, I think that the story of the Hungarian elections can be very nicely told by using exit voice and loyalty. Uh, namely, the Hungarian uh, elections reflect to an extreme degree mass exit of citizen reform uh, politics from formal democratic politics. This is the lowest turnout uh, at Hungarian parliamentary elections since 1998. They also reflect voice, namely the rise of radical voice, uh, which uh, is pretty much a characteristic uh, of the rollback of democracy Europe-wide. In Hungary, the success of the rising radical voice is extreme. As you know, <clears throat> Jobbik ended up as uh, 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 a party that got more than 20%. In addition to that, uh, out of 106 electoral district, districts, uh, Jobbik ended up as second in 40 places, uh, which is quite a strong presence. And a third issue that could be mentioned here is evaporating loyalty. Europe-wide, you see that parties lose their members, uh, the voters identified with them, and their relationships with civil society actors, which is a major issue at this conference, are atrophied. Now, what we see in Hungary in this respect is, of course, a long ongoing process. So rolling back the rollback might mean a rebuilding of civil and political society relationships. Uh, clearly, at the elections, there was a strong deficit of mobilization on the left liberal side in 20 districts where actually the left liberals would have had strong chances to win. The turnout of the electorate was below average. So what is at issue here is what has happened, not just during these elections, but in a longer historical perspective, between left liberalism, uh, the concept of democracy and civil society in Hungary, whether it belongs more to the right or far right uh, side of the political spectrum or the left and liberal side of the political spectrum. Thanks. Thank you, Bela. Um, well, uh, my temptation is to, uh, is to follow up uh, those points, but, uh, but we, we do have uh, an agenda here, so we'll stick to it and get back to the election. Um, after we hear your three statements about what has happened here uh, since uh, 2010 uh, to formerly uh, democratic institutions, how they have been systematically weakened, and Renata, um, we'll start with you on, on the weakening of the, of the Constitution. And, and pull the, pull the uh, mic okay. close. Yeah. Thank you. I, I would probably start in with, with a more general framework of, of what should be the framework of, of Hungarian developments with the constitutions. Uh, because I, I do believe that the Hungarian story fits in a broader story of, of how the magic of national constitutions have, have faded not only in Europe but also in the US, and, and how this is partly due to the fact that constitutions did become the victim of their own success in keeping political actors and governments at bay. Uh, the problem at the moment is not so much that, that the magic is gone. I mean, magic can easily be uh, fading. and. But the problem is that national constitutions uh, do not really have an alternative at the moment which uh, would constrain or, or order politics. So currently you have gentlemen's agreements in place except that the people who play politics are not necessarily gentlemen. Uh, and what makes this a little gloomy as a picture is that the legitimacy and success, the political success of the control mechanisms which are uh, proposed by the European Commission now all depend on some sort of functioning of, of a national constitution. Uh, now, when I, when I speak of the magic, I would probably emphasize four 
forced trains and there are a lot more and, and I would like to suggest that there is not even an agreement on these, on these forced trains. But, but nonetheless, I would like to put them on the table. Probably the, the, the first leg of the magic or component of the magic is that national constitutions did install some sort of lasting limitations, lasting past elections and electoral cycles on, on political players. Whether we think of it as constraints or self-restraint, that depends on, on what genre of a political theorist you are. But nonetheless, there were rules to the game which applied across electoral cycles. Uh, these were options, and, and this is part of, of the magic, which applied for winners as well as, as well as losers within the political realm. So losing an election did not mean that you will go to jail directly. It meant that you became the opposition of the government of the day. Uh, this works through institutional guarantees and also through uh, securing political rights to enable criticism of the government of the day and, and dissent. Uh, now, Constitutions, and this is my, my third submission on, on the trick they used to do and why we used to like them, uh, they were understood to be special partly due to the circumstances in which they were made. Uh, revolutionary constitution making was, was, was not in fashion in the second half of the 20th century, but still the constitution making moment was understood to be special and to a large extent irreproducible. Uh, they were very often imperfect in terms of missing proper legitimacy. So anti what, what hinged on the period afterwards was to, res to, to maintain the legitimacy of the constitution and to, to restore the legitimacy of the constitution making moment. Now the, the, the fourth bit of the magic and academics here have a, have a big responsibility is that knowing that the constitutional texts are imperfect and that they have, have gaps, uh, commentators and academics placed faith in, in uh, unspoken and unwritten principles associated with these texts. And what, what is very important for us today is irrespective of whether you translated these unwritten principles as constitutional culture, as the unwritten constitution, as civic religion, Commentators associated these unwritten rules, which were supposed to be the glue of the text, with the people, the people who were supposed to be having this constitution as their own project. Now, what we've seen, uh, and, and the Hungarian example is, is really just an example of this, is that the constraints in national constitutions simply became inconveniences which could be, and it was suggested, should be done away with uh, whenever politically necessary. And in this sense, uh, the, the 20th century necessities, some of them are more dramatic than others. 9-11 was definitely a very dramatic necessity. It capitalized on fear, and many of the constitutional constraints on the executive power were actually done away in an atmosphere of fear with, with almost perfect unanimity from the political elites. Um, whether we are speaking about torture, rendition, or, or simply exporting unconstitutional practices to remote places beyond the reaches of, of, of traditional checks and balances, these practices, which are associated with the war on terror, definitely did undermine the function of constitutions in constraining the exercise of raw political power. And of course, there are the ordinary practices. And the ordinary practices, and I hate to, to break it, at least in, in Central and Eastern Europe, are associated with membership in international organizations such as NATO and the EU. Um, it became routine to pass constitutional amendments in order to enable membership and participation in these organizations. So constitutional amendments, instead of being these rare moments of, of consent building and reflecting on who the political community is and who not changes, became examples of routine power management. And then you see this spillover to other layers of, of the legal sphere, such as, for instance, electoral engineering. Hungary is not the only country where power preservation of the sitting political elite is done through 
uh, reshuffling electoral rules. You don't even have to look all the way to the east. You can also look to the to the west. So when when you when you look at these constitutional constraints as being technical daily adjustments, then of course you have to realize that national governments are in a weird position in the EU. They are in a weird position because the policy sphere, the policy space they are in is shrinking, partly due to broadening European competences and partly exactly because of the economic crisis due to the growing codependency of national economies. Now, if you cannot make policy on subjects on which you have, you have to spend, the only thing you can make politics on is actually identity politics. And identity politics, the kind of, of, of sheer naked identity politics, which is about othering whoever you don't like, whether they are refugees or gays or religious minorities, uh, this is what replaces constitution making and, uh, and, and proper policy making at the same time. To bring an example which is not a Hungarian example, look at recently Slovakia. They badly needed to pass constitutional amendments to enable judicial reform. The way to get the majority to do that was to get someone who will produce the votes for the Judiciary Reform Amendment, and the votes are coming at a price of putting an amendment on the prohibition of same-sex marriage in the Constitution. So this is how actually identity politics is, is, is becoming a replacement. Now, and then you have your disinterested electorate, uh, uh, which doesn't seem to be wanting to even cast votes in elections. So why is this a headache? This is a headache uh, because European monitoring and, and control mechanisms are pictured by current governments as invasion, as foreign invasion. The, the translation of foreign invasion, of course, depends a lot on, on uh, local context and local sentiments. It's prisoners' voting rights in one country and same-sex marriage in another country, so there is, there is great national variation. Now, the, the best case scenario, however, is that, especially if you look at the Commission proposal, is, is using whatever is left from the mobilization forces of, of political opposition forces and civil society around them, uh, the European Forum, not so much as a replacement, but as an addition to all those opportunities which, which the constitutional amendments and, uh, and related rules took away from them on the national level. It's, a set, it's an opportunity, but it's also a sad story because you, you have an almost neutered civil society in many of these countries, and their, their last resort is to, to try to channel disagreement through European mechanisms. Now, why this is, the opportunity part is, is clear. Why this is less than, than promising? It's less than promising because the new mechanisms and any mechanism within the EU is to be termed in terms of EU competencies. So only those grievances resonate, which, which actually resonate with EU mandates and, and, and EU powers. So that means that the local actors, which are increasingly less powerful and more fragmented, need to be able to act more strategically than ever and find pressure points within the European Union framework, which might even be totally irrelevant and not secondary, but tertiary on, on the national political level in order to be able to mobilize dissent to the point where European Union mechanisms focusing on strategic failures in the member states can be signaled in, in a very remote and slow moving process. Thank you, Renata. Um, Gaspar, um, what is your take? Well, it's, uh, it's a complex issue, so if, if you allow me, I'll I'll give you a few instances of the difficulties that are facing uh, a very fragmented public with uh, some democratic yearnings. One of the examples is the name of this country has been until 2010 the Hungarian Republic. This has been changed in the new constitution. Hungary is now called Hungary, simply. 
Why is this important? Uh, you know, in all countries, there are traditional authorities to which people relate. You know, in Britain it's still the crown. You know, the government is called Her Majesty's government. In America it's the Union. In France it's the Republic. People can identify with simple words, simple expressions, their political identity. Our modern history has begun in the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, where the head of the state was at the same time uh, the leader of the enemy, uh, of the rival of Austria. Uh, Franz Josef has said, uh, although he was a supranational ruler, that ich bin ein Deutscher Fürst, all the same, he was a German prince. And um, so identifying with the political structure in which people lived was always difficult. We never had a real popular system. Nobody should believe that uh, the regent uh, uh, reserve Admiral von Horty uh, has been ever popular. He may have been feared and respected, but certainly not recognized as a popular leader, which he never wanted to be. He had a great contempt for the people, uh, openly expressed. This is how we know. And, uh, and then we had, of course, real socialism, uh, and that is a, a form of state capitalism. And, and it was a short period, as I said, which just ended, without a real points of identification, political identification for the populace. It was neither the constitution, the uh, importance of which has not been understood. And it's a very characteristic, stupid debate in Hungary uh, Discuss the constitution in terms of it was a Stalinist constitution, it has been said about the liberal constitution only because officially it has been numbered as the law of 1949, number 20, I think, 21. And, uh, uh, and as they say, only one sentence remained from the Stalinist constitution uh, it, that Hungary's capital is Budapest, and the rest has been changed. Nevertheless, uh, Mr. Orban's party has attacked the Stalinist constitution for a decade without being effectively contradicted by anybody, and nobody had the idea to change the numbering of this law. And you know, the thing is that, that there was always a divorce between what people thought about political reality, promising or not, and the basic structures and the fundamental liberties that pertain to the constitutional system. And therefore, when the opposition, especially the opposition intelligentsia, was criticizing the Orban government uh, for its lack of commitment to a minimum of uh, uh, liberties and liberal practices and toleration and pluralism and so on and so forth, uh, Nobody actually could uh, feel that this criticism was uh, based on a basic order shared by everybody and anchored in a constitutional text that was fundamental and beyond, as you said, politics as usual. Now, so therefore, the difference between constitution and everyday politics the difference between a basic state order and the style of government is not understood, and not, it is not not understood because the public is silly, but because it has been seen the same way by the practitioners of politics and by the political elites and by everybody, and the calculation of advantages and disadvantages of preferments and firings of uh, 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 gains and losses has replaced every kind of philosophical discussion and moral discussion of politics. And this has meant a political culture both of extreme pragmatism and utilitarianism and also uh, given to myth-making and uh, blind belief of various kinds. Uh, because it was an empty space that had to be filled by the popular imaginary as being manipulated by various groups. 
so uh, the fate of Hungarian democracy, that you know, uh, in, in the way it just was, has been decided by the way in which the Orban government has been seen by the middle class, which uh, usually decides the fate of elections. And this middle class has felt that it was the beneficiary of economic policies. A double state, in a way, has developed in Hungary, a welfare state for the middle class and a police state for the rest. Now, about two million people in this country to which uh, new possibilities and perspectives were brought by the government policies, uh, really a welfare state, uh, redistribution towards the upper middle class and the middle class, and a brutal reduction of any policy that would have restored or kept any element of social justice, fairness and equality in a country where more than three million people live under the threshold of poverty. Uh, and it has been a moralizing rhetoric, a moralizing rhetoric that in a very old-fashioned moralizing rhetoric that actually present in all kinds of conservatism that, of course, designates the losers of any social deal as not being deserving morally. So a cold civil war is going on against the powerless and against the poor. A great deal of sinful pride is being celebrated in uh, uh, everyday politics. It's a, uh, certainly not a populist a party in the populist government in power. is an elitist and statist, very hard uh, politics that, that doesn't want to win hearts, but wants to win interests and scare the rest. Mr. Orban is not a baby-kissing populist politician at all. He doesn't want to be loved, and he isn't. And he's respected and feared and followed. Uh, the style of leadership of the Hungarian right is a characteristically conservative and authoritarian and elitist one. And what it wants to have is respect and fear and not affection and most certainly not a feeling of solidarity and not uh, uh, nobody is trying in this government to, to, to try to be embodiment of society because if you are the embodiment of a nation, the definition is yours. When Mr. Orban has declared uh, a few years ago that the country, the fatherland, cannot be in opposition, meaning himself, uh, that has been accepted by many because if indeed somebody took upon himself to embody the nation, which is of course only part of society, the nation is a very hazy and unclear notion, then indeed he can be followed without any uh, policy proposals or whatever. If the governing party has proposed in this election campaign one word, they, they presented no election manifesto. There was no election manifesto, no electoral program whatsoever, not a single word. That is a single word, they said, will continue. That was all. Meaning, believe in us and we'll lead you. There was only one poster, election poster, all over the country presenting a portrait of Mr. Orban saying, Viktor Orban, Hungary's prime minister. That's it. It just didn't say it will be better for you. Gaspar, the, you've, you, um, you've yes. uh, used up your time and, and some Sorry. of Bela's too. Um, but, uh, then I, uh, but, then but before... <laughs> then I'll refrain. Uh, brilliantly, may I say. But you said something. Uh, Bela, forgive me. I'm going to use up a little bit of your time too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> use it more. <laughs> 
Um, you said something that was ex that that was extremely provocative. Well, more than one thing, um, that for the uh, non uh, upper and middle class, Hungary is now a police state. And as somebody who who was born into uh, a Hungary that was indeed a police state that arrested my parents in front of my own eyes. Um, I, I, I need to uh, ask you if people are getting arrested for their views, if, um, if, if there is only one um, uh, voice in the media as, as there was when I was a little kid, um, and that was uh, the party organ. Uh, so a police state, that's a, that's a pretty uh, loaded term. Can you back that up? Good, yes. Uh, uh, you know, the Horthy era was a police state, and there was an opposition press, and there were opposition parties. And, uh, and it was Istvan, Istvan Bibo, no mean theorist, who called the Horthy era a conservative police state. That's the kind of police state I'm referring to, not to a totalitarian state, which of course it isn't. Uh, and people are not getting arrested for their views. That was before, as I know. Uh, but uh, I was briefly detained, not really, to jail. And, uh, and, uh, but people are arrested for their color. And, uh, for their color? Yes, yes. Yes. You're talking Bicyc about... Bicycling uh, while gypsy. Okay, so you're talking about Roma. Yes. Um. And, uh, and when people are uh, forced uh, to work uh, in a non-contractual environment, that is how they free society. And, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And... Um, so you know, uh, it is it is state control, and uh, uh, the control of the authorities uh, uh, regarding the poor population, especially in the countryside. It is nothing new that Budapest is free, while the country is not. That has always been the case in this country, except of course in the totalitarian era when not even Budapest was free, and so. Uh, so, you know, our history is repeating itself, a small wonder, it is the same country, and the practices are very similar, and it is pretty grim, not for the likes of me, although, yes, well, but, uh, but mostly for the uh, uh, poor, uh, semi-literate, miserable, and ignorant majority that is ever closer to the third world and which is kept under tight control. That's what I meant. Of okay. course, it was a, a, a slight abridgment. Okay, no. okay. Well, um, we, we need to get back to this issue of uh, um, the one that, that your, your, your point begs, which is where was the opposition uh, during the last four years and, um, and, is, and has the EU been paying attention. But before we do that, Bela, you're, you're now down to five minutes, so. Oh, no, <laughs> oh, I, I am all, all, I, 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 yeah, yeah, I, I am almost sorry to, you know, uh, to, stop no, this no, fascinating uh, conversation we'll, we'll, we'll and back bring it. back uh, the issue to some topics uh, which probably should be mentioned uh, with regard to uh, the process of hollowing out uh, of democracy, which is actually preceding across Europe uh, and has preceded in Hungary the rollback of, of democracy. So uh, the literature, and particularly Peter Mayer, uh, calls this process ruling the void uh, and basically defines its uh, reasons by, by a growing conflict between responsible government and responsive government, by which he basically means that governments that try to abide international treaties and laws, try to follow domestic and international political and policy commitments, are responsible increase, increasingly at the price of being not responsive to the demands of their electorates. Uh, 
Now, in such a situation, when there is a growing gap between responsible government and responsive government, res res representing the citizenry and being responsive, at least rhetorically, to their demands, is left to an opposition, which, is, which doesn't want to govern, but wants to express and represent, and uses for this very often populist and nationalist rhetorics. Now, this is happening everywhere in Europe, not only in Hungary, it happens in Latvia, it happens in Austria, France, Great Britain, as well as other countries. But what is interesting in the Hungarian case is that this uh, uh, populist na nationalist rhetorics and governing practice is extremely successful. Uh, as a socialist representative member of parliament once told, Orban did not win his two-thirds on the lottery, and now he repeated, actually. So we need to understand, actually, the attraction of these rhetorics and government practices, and should not be easy on nationalism and populism. So the point is, I am making, that the national populist rhetorics and government practice can be, although it, is an, it represents a very extreme swing uh, of the uh, pendulum, of the political pendulum in Europe, and therefore it is very rare, it can be particularly attractive in situations in which it can appear as a counter movement to a previous extreme swing of the political pendulum towards what I would call elitist, neoliberal, uh, uh, and uh, uh, elitist, neoliberal, internationalist position. So I, I see its attraction partly as a counter movement to its opposite. Now, um, when, in what situations uh, is it particularly successful? It can be successful in a situation when its opponents, elitist neoliberals, come to a crisis, a policy stalemate, uh, and an end of representation, an end of relationship, good relationship with civil actors. This is, of course, the situation of the crisis. In a crisis situation, many citizens fear to be left alone atomized by the market and not represented by their political leaders, on the one hand. So elitist internationalist neoliberalism seems less representative and less responsive than ever. Second, in a crisis situation, you see lots of policies and political stalemates. Uh, policy making can be paralyzed by uh, politicians being forced to make impossible choices. In this situation, responsible politics is, becomes, is, is becoming also very difficult. Here comes the popul populist leader and nationalist leader and, and tells the electorate, you are not represented, but I will represent you not as unequal, uh, divided people, but members of a fraternity nation and the people. And I am not only representative and responsive to your demands of being represented, but also responsible. Because responsibility in hard times means to resolve policy deadlocks caused in the populist rhetorics by overdependence, by external mean exploitative power. So here comes a situation where a populist nationalist leader and its movement and its party can appear at the same time as responsible and uh, representative or responsive to the population. Now, and here is the last statement, and again, this takes us back to the major issue of civil society. Uh, elitist, national, uh, elitist internationalist neoliberals came in Hungary to this deadlock due to 
a longer historical process in which there severed their initially relatively dense and well-functioning relationships with Hungarian civil society broadly conceived. Populist nationalists came to a victory and resolving apparently these policy deadlocks and appearing as representative through an asymmetric process in which a, a right and a far right that was initially not embedded in Hungarian civil society gradually built up its basis in trade unions, in local organizations, social movements, the media, and so on. So rolling back the rollback in this situation must take into serious consideration the importance of the right wing's position and the open society's left wing's lost position in Hungarian civil society, the importance of broad rather than very narrow concepts of democracy in which the citizen is expected to vote once every four years and not much else, and what are the related subjects at the level of high politics, at the level of ideologies, and at the level of grassroots organization. Thank you very much, Bela. Um, Renata, what uh, checks and balances, if any, remain to the very powerful uh, central authority, which is, which is, let's call it what it is now, urbanism. What are the checks and balances? Uh, Gaspar, if you have an answer, well, uh, uh, yeah, okay. Renata, yeah. You, you, you don't seem to like that question. <laughs> I mean, it's a, well, it's a long, and boring constitutional answer, so I... Well, I give, us, give us a non-boring answer. So I, I try, I, I try my, my best, because what you are used to in terms of checks and balances is take the constitutional court. The constitutional court is understood to be actually a mechanism of parliamentary self-control. Parliament elects judges on the constitutional court in order to correct mistakes and departures from, from the basic law which it might do because of ignorance or, or because in the heat of debate. Now, what you've seen in Hungary, and it's extremely well documented, is that the Constitutional Court from day one has been uh, something to be disciplined by the majority of the day. Uh, constitutional amendments targeting the court in terms of cutting, the, uh, cutting its uh, jurisdiction, changing the manner of election of the justices, and finally raising the number of the justices in order to permit total court packing and then to raise the, the maximum age uh, until which people can serve on, on, on this court because apparently choices were not made very carefully when the court was packed and mm -hmm. age was not a factor at the time. So all these rules now result in essentially neutering the court. You have to wait until three people's terms expire to have a perfectly packed constitutional court. And, and the court is not not one, not just one sole example, it's one of many examples. Another example which, which political scientists and constitutional theories love is constitutions including ex additional guarantees for regulat regulating particular sectors with qualified majority or two-thirds majority. Now what you see as a pattern in the Hungarian case is that uh, well, typically legislation on key areas, and one of my pet examples is, is freedom of religion here, uh, is, is always a long brainstorming process where statutory, so spur of the moment ideas are made into statutes and then the constitutional provision is made to fit that statute which was supposed to be passed by two thirds majority. And when on the same subject you have altogether four constitutional amendments to fit the original idea, which then turns out to backfire, then you see how a two thirds majority requirement in the constitution actually turns into a farce. So domestic checks are, are removed and no, you you can't cite a single check on uh, on on central authority. Well, it's I, I I just want to give a shred of hope to our listeners. Are there no, any no, checks? 
Look, I mean, if you, if you think in terms of, and I think it's also a telling story, if you think in terms of the midterm elections, uh, which took place a few months before the general elections, where the opposition successfully litigated before the Supreme Court violations of the then re, uh -huh. refashioned election rules uh -huh. on, on campaign silence and, and, and campaigning in the public square, they won in the Supreme Court and in, in a matter of days, the, electoral, the election laws were amended in order to overturn the Supreme Court and to, to make sure that those guarantees which the Supreme Court reaffirmed are not in place anymore. So to talk about checks in a situation where the Constitution and any law of constitutional significance is amended on a daily basis is, is, is actually lying to yourself. And, and that's why I, I don't want to, to actually list some of the remaining checks because that's just giving ideas of what needs to be amended. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> God forbid. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you, <laughs> Gaspar. Uh, the yes. media, the media typically play, uh, plays a controlling uh, and checking role in in a democracy. How is the media faring in Hungary? <laughs> All right. Uh, the answer will be quite simple, and so I can keep it short. Um, uh, but just a word about what Professor Greshkovich has said, I don't think that uh, this regime and its leader are either nationalist or populist. Well, they did differ on this, right? Yes. Uh, How, oh, what do you mean by that? Not nationalist? Not nationalist. Ethnicism is not nationalism. Kossuth was a nationalist. Petrofi was a nationalist. Mitskevich was a nationalist. Not these people. And, uh, In other words, he, he doesn't represent the entire nation. No, 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 no. The nationalists don't necessarily represent the whole nation, for God's okay, sake. Okay, then what do you but mean? No, 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 no. I mean, nationalism is an idea. It's mm -hmm. not totally limitless. Nationalism means uh, broadly an idea of the solidarity of citizens of a given nation states for national goals and... Uh, both grandeur and freedom, but it's basically a civic idea. It's not an ethnic and not a racial idea. And it has been historically uh, linked to the development of European liberal democracy, and it comes from the French Revolution and not from the Bourbons. There's a difference. And, uh, and you know, when uh, uh, Marshal Pétain has changed the device of France from liberté, uh, égalité, fraternité to famille, travail, patrie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, famille, travail, patrie is something that you can recognize in a number of countries which I'm too shy to name. And, and, uh, and that's not okay. nationalism. Nationalist was de Gaulle, not Pétain. That, there's a difference. And, uh, and uh, nationalism has uh, uh, democratic valences and values of liberty, which ethnicism hasn't. So that's, uh, I, I don't want, I'm not a nationalist, but I still don't want to slander nationalism that played a very complex, sometimes progressive role in history. Can I just interrupt for one second and say that that uh, that a democracy consists of two parties, actually, the ruled and the and the and the rulers. That is to say, that you you, you need a responsible citizenry um, to to make a de democracy function. Um, does Hungary have a responsible citizenry in that the, make sufficient responsibility for self governing, which is which is uh, really at the at the heart of a democracy, self. Governing, because what what you're all describing here is a is a nation that is increasingly detached, apathetic, low low ver, vote turnout, uh, four years of, of of hundreds of constitutional amendments, and and very little pushback. Is that does that represent a responsible uh, self -gover governing population? Well, I can give a very simple answer to that. Can you really blame people for losing hope? It's not, it's not a question of responsibility. People are not indifferent to the fate of their nation. They feel, and I share that feeling, mm -hmm. in this one respect I can identify with the majority, that the present political structure uh, doesn't really 
uh, offer immediate uh, opportunities for meaningful democratic change. So when people stay at home, that doesn't mean that they are irresponsible and passive and cowardly and all that. They're pessimistic. They're pessimistic. Well, pessimism is not a policy. And they turn their back on this, on mm -hmm. this political structure and mm -hmm. on this regime. They have mm -hmm. ex excellent reasons for doing that. Um, so not, I don't blame. I wouldn't blame them. Yeah, no, I'm not blaming them. I'm just trying to uh, oh. uh, provoke a, a, a conversation. And since uh, we have no one here from Fides, although we did ask uh, quite um, energetically, we, we, we sought Fides representation, but we were unable to get that. So Bela, could you for a minute play the the uh, advocate, <laughs> uh, the advocate for Fides, and explain to me, explain to us. Uh, why it is that uh, that you won such a, such a resounding uh, victory last night? What what have you done for the country? Thank you, Kati. Uh, yeah. Representing the Fidesz perfectly fits my life, That's career, and That's why you and, and, and political uh, uh, preferences, and actually my dreams and visions yes. about good life. So so let me talk well, about. Do your best. Let, 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 let me talk about serious issues, however. No, no, uh, uh, one is what I was thinking a lot about another uh, set of constraints, economic constraints, uh, and, and the EU as a constraint. Why did these two not really work? So A, economic constraints. The fall of the Orban government based on economic reasons was several times predicted, both by uh, internal domestic liberal economists and sometimes by international rating agencies. It has never happened. And one reason is that we are in crisis. Uh, the field of ideas is open for experimentation, and this government experiments relatively skillfully. Uh, it attacks economic problems, uh, which seem to be acceptable as problems and the solution for the population as well as EU actors. It relatively carefully maneuvers between international and domestic constraints. So what we see is a gradual, slow-moving erosion of Hungarian economic position, but this is not exceptional in Europe. But we don't see a dramatic, uh, threatening collapse uh, of the Hungarian economic system. Uh, let me get back to the EU issue. I am very disappointed uh, with the way the EU, and generally speaking, the international community, uh, reacted to the Hungarian uh, erosion uh, of democracy. Although I am not the one who really thinks that at the moment, at a given moment, the international markets and the EU should make order here and teach us again how to use knife and fork uh, when we uh, get our dinner or, or lunch. Nevertheless, I think that the Hungarian case actually shows the serious limitations on the capacity, will, and skill of international actors uh, to intervene into Hungarian the Hungarian situation. So the EU can tackle legalistic issues, some formal issues, but not the major issue of the cause of democracy. For the United States of America to bring in another potentially international actor, important international actor, Hungary is a small case. So I did not see much involvement uh, on behalf of the United States in the situation either. I expect, given the Ukraine-Russia situation, even less interest and even less involvement on the part of both the European Union and the United States. So the European Union will be even more uh, enmeshed in solving the economic crisis, not very successful in my eyes, the United States with the threats to its hegemony, with rising counterpowers. So in this context, Hungary can, with a relatively skillful maneuvering between Skulla and Karadis, 
pretty much survive unless some other unexpected international uh, events happen, dramatic events in the economic and political field. In my, in my search for uh, a, a Fidesz spokesperson, I, I cut you off um, when you were uh, going to tell us about the media's role in um, sustaining what is left of a democratic society here. Can you, can you deal with that uh, briefly and then we'll open up for questions. Yes, it has been calculated that uh, the media leaning towards the opposition reached 2% of the population. Uh, for all those constituencies where you could see on the maps that it was all orange colored, with one single exception in the countryside, there's one constituency in which the opposition has won, of all of outside of Budapest constituencies, only one, right? In those which, orange, which that? in that, in Seged, which is a big city, so it's not, mm -hmm. not really countryside, okay? And a uh, university town. And uh, it's um, in, in those orange colored districts, what do people hear and read? They hear radio while working or washing up. And the only non right wing radio station broadcast only in Budapest, all the rest are conservative, right-wing, or worse. Uh, the local radio and territorial regional television are all right-wing, pro-government. The country-written press is all pro-government and right-wing. Don't forget that 93% of uh, local councils have a right-wing majority. Already. And this is getting worse now. Probably now, uh, so uh, you know, free press that is being handed out to people is all government. So most people are not simply aware that facts have an other interpretation than what the right offers. And here in this town, of course, you can uh, reach various things and so on. There's of course the younger people who can uh, have things on the internet but the majority of the provincial politician, those people who vote between 40 and 60, they, that's the only resource, and they can uh, uh, counter this only with their personal experience, but not any uh, rationalized framework created by, usually by the media. So this is how they should deliberate and decide in politics. It's grim. And in general, you know, we shouldn't be flippant here. What is happening is, well, it's our country, and what's happening is a tragedy. And, uh, and this is one of the explanations. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Gaspar. Um, we, we would love to hear your questions, and, uh, and, and it would be great if they were questions. You wanted to say something. <laughs> yes. Uh, Christoph Wagner from the Open Society Foundations. Um, Going forward, when do you think, if at all, the regime will use violence um, against the opposition? And I'm asking that because the machinery for that is already set up in terms of the control of the state attorney's office, in terms of the counterterrorism <coughs> units that are basically Orban's personal bodyguards, in terms of the pre-trial detention rules that they're already using against opposition and so on. Um, who would like to take that one? Okay. Uh, I don't expect uh, violence used by the regime because there will not be any need for that. Uh, because I don't foresee uh, large chances for a violent uprising or riot on behalf of the opposition, be it for a far right kind of riot. In which case, the use of the police forces and the oppressive machinery uh, can happen at local levels. But even in that case, I expect sort of a peaceful resolution uh, of local conflicts between the center right and, and the far right. So I don't see uh, 
at the moment, uh, uh, any revolutionary activity and the related use of oppressive uh, machinery. Yes. Thank you. Heather Graby from Open Society European Policy in Brussels. Um, this uh, technique of, of closing down the, uh, the extent of political space, closing down policy debate, closing down um, also the means of having an open debate is quite well known from a number of contexts. And typically it comes to an end when people get tired of the great charismatic leader, however charismatic, however great. Um, in Italy, for example, in the end, Berlusconi lost power. Now, how did that happen? It happened because a new, a new generation, a really fresh face came in and came out with uh, new ideas. Now, in Italy, there were two faces. One was a true populist who was so much more populist than the guy in power. So could that happen in Hungary? Could there be, say, a Fizzo sort of figure or, or indeed a Beppe Grillo kind of figure? And the second guy who has now come to power was somebody from local level, was a mayor who managed to gain credibility at local level. So I just use this very rough analogy just to ask, where are the sources of hope? Yeah, great the question. Is there, is there a new generation of uh, leaders that we can attach some hope to? Well, I'd be glad if you introduced me to them. <laughs> but you can't name one? What about you, Renata? Any, any well, this young... Is, I mean, in Hungary, you have a, a long waiting game. And don't forget that the current parliament is half the size of the previous parliament. That means that you have at least half of the... Half of the people who used to be in, in the faction are still awaiting positions. So currently they are trying to preserve or get into elected positions in, in the local levels, in the local elections. Mm -hmm. and, and there is a very strongly held and centrally controlled patronage system. Uh, together with the silencing of the opposition in, in the local media as well, uh, you, you definitely need to wait and, and, and see what the new parliament, together with the local elections, bring. And uh, you also have to, and this is partly in response to, to Christoph, yesterday the newly elected prime minister made two very interesting rhetorical gestures. The first one was that after he saw the results, he talked to Gerd Sabat, the speaker of the first parliament, and the second one was that this is a government which stays friends with the EU. Now that was the first openly pro-EU gesture of the Prime Minister for a long, long time. A pro-EU government. Not much friends. Mm -hmm. You won't quit. Uh, a pro-EU a pro government will, will not be starting to sh shoot down dissent openly on, on the street with, with using the capacities which it, mm -hmm. it unquestionably has, has built up. Yes, you had a question. Uh. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Jan Nedvedek from the European Youth Parliament, representing our office in, in Berlin. Um, you really do portray quite a grim picture. Um, I hope it's not that bad, but I mean, all right. They, um, they seem to know what they're talking about. <laughs> I, I guess. Um, you always love talking about Fides, which is understandable. Um, I'm quite surprised you haven't mentioned Jobbik yet. Uh, but I guess that's just that bad that you don't even want to talk about it. Uh, my question really is, I mean, there seems to be a bit of a trend in Central Europe. I mean, after all, we are Central European University. Um, you have Mr. Fietzel in Slovakia, and although he was recently defeated, he is still a, you know, um, the guy in Slovakia. Uh, we lost, unfortunately, in the Czech Republic, we lost Mr. Havel, and Mr. Zeman now seems to have some tendencies to, you know, uh, our president to sort of um, assume a lot of power. Um, does it mean that democratic transition has failed in Central Europe? Um, yes. <laughs> I, I would disagree with you that this is a trend that is restri restricted to Central Europe. It is a European trend of uh, weakening democracy. And in Central Europe, there are countries who do much which do much better than in Hungary and in Western Europe there are countries that are doing close or Western uh, and Southern Europe there are countries which do as bad as uh, Hungary uh, so I think one cannot then infer that the transition in East Central Europe went uh, you know was generally a mistake or failed one has to analyze a diverse uh, picture uh, in a whole European context rather than just focusing on this region. So the, the region has its specificities, 
but there is there are broader processes and the crisis exaggerates them you know both in the debtor countries of europe let's call them like this and and those who who credit them so there are problems uh, both in a comparative and in a trans uh, european context if i may add something to this uh, the uh, little party of the greens lmp was a favorite party of the young urban intelligentsia campaigned on the premise that we must put an end to these past 25 years. A total break, because it has been a total flop, absolute tragedy. So, you know, uh, the feeling that the democratic transition uh, in Eastern Europe is the exact contrary of its success is very strong. Of course, you know, when in a more nuanced discussion you cannot say such things, but this is a feeling very widely shared including people believing in freedom and democracy. This is not only the feeling of the far right or anything like that, but that this is a failure, this is a feeling widely shared by quite reflective and freedom-loving people too. Renata? Let me, let me just add to, to very quickly what, what Vela was saying. Central Europe in, seems difficult to explain when it comes to, to these right-wing extremist intolerant movements because you don't see the enemy. And in Western Europe, uh, you do see the enemy. And in Central, Central Europe, you, you don't have the Muslim immigrants. You don't have those forces which, which seemingly make the phenomenon easy to explain. So why is it better? Or why, why is it more explainable to have an extremist movement to the flood of immigrants who, who are of a different color and a different than the majority's religion? Why, why is that easier to explain than, than the phenomena here? Uh, why is that not about the weaknesses of, of democratic and constitutional structures in, in, in Western democracies as, as well? So I would very much ag agree, and I think that it's not a Central European problem, except that you find current developments in societies in the West which, which make explaining extremism on its face easier without having to go to the root causes into, into the crisis of, of democratic institutions. Um, before we take your question, um, you made a good point in that we haven't touched on Jobbik. Um, let's just take a minute to, um, starting with you, Gaspar, what is um, Jobbik has has emerged um, with a with a pretty healthy uh, 20, 20 plus percent. Um, what do you read that? And can you and and Jobbik's, um, to Renata's point about um, about enemies, perceived enemies, and invi invisible enemies. Jobbik's enemies are whom exactly? Well, we're sitting here. Uh, yes, here, yeah, yeah, these people, and uh, but and not only them. Uh, no, but uh, uh, that's a, an extremely important point. Uh, what what you've made, and indeed the problem in Central Europe, the specific problem in Central Europe, is not the extreme right, which is a pretty mm -hmm. general European phenomenon. This is, in a way, the less interesting because they are quite similar. Well, there are differences, but they're quite similar to other extremist forces of this kind. Jobbik represents two things. One, of course, is an anti-establishment uprising, you know, young, uh, uninvolved in the past, etc., etc. Uh, renewal, anyway. It's anti globalization. Anti, well, an, I wouldn't. Globalization is too precise. Anti the world. Anti the foreigners. <laughs> anti everybody else who is not us. And, uh, and of course, their, their precise targets are, of course, are mostly the Roma. And uh, 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 although they have softened this image somewhat, uh, of course, they're also anti-Semitic, of course. And they, uh, they, their preferred past, of course, is the uh, wartime uh, dictatorships and so on and so forth. At the same time, they also have a hidden ideology known by very few people. You know, they have their own ideologists about the sacred kingdoms and uh, uh, taking up the absolutely counter-revolutionary tradition. For example, they admire 
Prince Windisch Gretz and Marshal Heinau and not Kossuth and Sitchin, the Hungarians will understand, you know, uh, etc. legitimate kingdom from the Middle Ages, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and, uh, uh, but basically they reflect people's dissatisfaction and disgust, dissatisfaction with and disgust for the, the, the prevailing uh, democracy, its hypocrisy and its lies and so on, and embodies something that is quite similar also to the mainstream right, which I have called the passion of inequality. This is a political religion of contempt, and this really invading the psychological space of this country, and not only of this country. Thank uh, you. you. You had a question. Um, Andrew Wilkins, Stiftung Mercator in Berlin. I, I have a question whether the, the case of Hungary, is it really an isolated case or has it the potential of contagion? Um, are there governments in Europe, are there movements who see Hungary and Orban as a model? And I'm asking this with the context that that Europe on the economic crisis has really only started acting once it began came clear that there is a contagion from Greece to Spain, from Greece to Portugal, from potentially Italy. Only then Europe got active. Once they, they were only isolated cases, they, they, you know, nothing happened. Um, okay, Bela. Uh, yeah, this, that's, uh, that is a very in important question, actually. And uh, clearly there are uh, attempts to emulate uh, Orban, for instance, in Poland, uh, Kaczynski referred to Orban several times as, as someone whose policies and politics he, he admires and would like to follow. Uh, there are earlier analogies. Uh, for instance, uh, Heather mentioned here the case of Berlusconi in Italy. So that was actually a, a government uh, that, that used uh, strong populist rhetorics uh, and sometimes uh, practices and, and the media. And then there are isolated uh, outbursts of, of dissatisfaction with uh, the traditional kind of hollowed out, de out democracy under the uh, conditions of the crisis in Greece and, and in, in other countries. So I would say, and, and this is what I argued from the beginning on, that, uh, that Hungary is is a case within a broader context of problems with democracy, but an extreme case. And the reason is a previous very strong, partly even for sometimes successful, elitist, democratic, economically neoliberal and internationalist development. We see here an extreme swing of the political pendulum following a previous extreme. So yes, part of a broader disheartening process, but an extreme case on uh, that dimension. Well, don't forget uh, Putinism, which is in was some never ways a the democracy. Yeah. Well, um, okay, we could debate that. Um, we'll, we'll take. We're, we've run out of time, and I, um, I don't want to. Um, but we, we'll take these two questions because you've both been very patient. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, Michał Sotowski from Krytyka Polityczna, Poland. I got a question to Professor Tomasz. Uh, you said that uh, it is the middle class that actually makes the difference in, um, in, the electoral, in the electoral process. On the other hand, you said that um, uh, Hungary today is a welfare state for middle class and upper classes and the police state for the others. So we know from the West that if there is a strong economic division it's, uh, between these classes, it is very easy to play with that dichotomy and to stigmatize the lower classes for the political elite and to, to achieve uh, middle classes support. So it all means the conclusion would be that uh, the, only, uh, the only situation in which we could radically change the political situation here would be to restore some kind of some sort of solidarity between the middle classes and the lower classes, and do you believe that the left in Hungary uh, is uh, would be able to to restore such kind of solidarity, and how could they do that? Good point. Well, this left definitely not. <laughs> and uh, uh, to answer frankly the question and what is implied by it, 
I think that uh, what is called uh, wrongly uh, the left in Hungary uh, will have to be reorganized and restarted and refounded in its present shape. It doesn't serve the interests and the aspirations of those that it should and it professes to do. So this uh, 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 alliance of left liberal forces must bow out politely and graciously and give way to people who are both uh, uh, more egalitarian and more democratic in the original sense of the word and also more skillful, more intelligent, more passionate and more mm. sincere. Mm. A tall order. Uh, okay, your final question. Thank you, uh, Helmut Anhoy from the Hertie School. Uh, Rector Shattuck mentioned civil society. Uh, Dean Weinecke mentioned civil society. And in the panel, hardly anybody. I think, Bela, you may, may have mentioned civil society. Uh, why didn't it feature in what you talked about? I think the so whole, where is it? Yeah, yeah where is I, it in I, I actually think the whole discussion has been about civil society, although we didn't call it that. Yes. So let me, let me just, I, I, I actually don't share that we didn't talk about That's civil society, right. but, but I, I would think that, that it's, again, not a Hungarian story. On the one hand, we talked a lot about participation, and, and, and look at mass participation and the successes in Europe. The Bulgarians have been protesting for more than 200 days, uh, every single day, and they could not even get an early election. And that was a very strongly non-party-based civil society-based movement. The, the forms of public participation which are funded and championed, uh, the ones in, in high-order politics, the ones which you see in Iceland and Ireland, turned out into these highly structured and, and stage-managed discussion clubs, which absolutely didn't bring up and resolve key constitutional issues. The, the Irish constitutional uh, making process ended up with, with four issues, one of them uh, on, on having a constitutional amendment to put bl the blasphemy provision of the constitution on, on referendum. That's highly a foundational issue in Ireland today. At the same time, and, and this is what I was trying to, to, to bring in when it comes to civil society participation, civil society participation in order to bring in high order constitutional level change became an affair which requires super expertise and, and, and funds which were previously unseen. You have to know much, much more the processes via which you can make an impact. You have to know the pressure points very well and the domestic pressure points differ very much from the international ones. Actually, the best you can currently hope for is to export the, those items of the opposition agenda which resonate in Europe and the prize is actually pretty saddening because the prize is <coughs> not more than restoring the European <coughs> minimum. What you see in the European Union now as a constitutional minimal understanding is actually drawing on the consensus and some sort of a European common core of, of this is how a decent constitution looks like. The, the, the terminology for that is the rule of law. But actually what you get to restore via all the work uh, that you may do through the Commission, through the Parliament, and, and through the commissioners and through litigation is get back to the minimum where you started from because that was actually the entry price when, when you were invited to the table. Now, uh, so on the one hand, it's extremely expensive. It requires expertise which, which, is, which has previously been, un, been unseen and civil society organizations seem to, so we place hope in civil society organizations uh, in, in tasks which they were not meant to perform. That is the job of the political opposition. And, and so to simply say that the opposition fared and now civil society organizations go ahead, this is exactly as mistaken as to, as to blame the people for not having the proper constitutional culture. Yeah, so the rollback has, has impacted on, on the instruments of the state and on institutions of the state as well as the media. The civil society uh, has uh, traditionally not been particularly uh, strong here, nor, nor has it been specifically targeted. Um, so that the, the, the rollback was, is, has been focused on, on other instruments. Um, I, I, I know there are other questions, but, um, but we've, 
we're now 10 minutes over time. Uh, I want to thank my, my panelists. Uh, Renata Gaspar had to give an interview, so he raced away. And Bela, um, I, and on behalf of um, all of you, I thank a really very interesting uh, conversation.